Okay, uh, again, uh, very good uh, morning to all of you. Uh, in fact, this is going to be probably the uh, uh, next uh, chapter that we're going to treat with chapter 4. If I end up uh, with chapter 3, then we've got a couple of exercises to do in chapter 3. But chapter 3 is also uh, very much related to chapter 4. So you will see some of those actually what we have learned in chapter 3 will be sort of reused in chapter 4. Uh, more importantly, uh, if you look at chapter 4, it is more into looking into the uh, types of engine that we are going to talk about. So there is a lot of, uh, uh, well, terms in terms of uh, fuel, uh, in terms of the oxidation that, that we will be using. Uh, now, more importantly, I think you better take note of uh, all these actually uh, fuels and oxidators that you have here. I'll be, I'll be not actually repeating them. Uh, I think you you got to actually probably write it down so that uh, you can follow the lecture quite clearly. Uh, the typical ones that I've written here is basically, uh, if you look at MMH, uh, UDMH, hydrazine, uh, these are the fuel, then you have oxidators, uh, nitric acid, hydrogen peroxide, uh, nitrogen tetroxide, these are very, very uh, common ones. Then you have uh, exclusive ones, you can uh, you can see refined petrol, which is uncommon. So what you see from, uh, from this spot to down, it is uh, not very, very common, uh, but yet it is uh, in use uh, in, uh, in space or rather in rocket. Uh, so uh, please take note of that, uh, so that you can uh, follow the lecture quite clearly. Okay, go on. So if you look at a, a rocket engine system, basically you can uh, define or rather categorize them into three uh, basic uh, design. Uh, if you look at a liquid fuel, uh, basically there is an oxidator and then the fuel, and practically it will be mixed in a the chamber, then you have uh, uh, the actual thrust. Hybrid engine, obviously, you will have that oxidator and you have the fuel as well, but the fuel is going to be a solid fuel here. Uh, this is not very common. Uh, this is uh, it's quite common. So uh, this is called hybrid. And then the final one is actually solid. Now, uh, be very clear here, the exercises that you have done, for example, Ariane 5 and all those common rockets, popular rockets, are actually using this design exclusively for fuel engines and this design exclusively for solid fuel engine. That means what is booster. If you can remember clearly, this is booster and this is the uh, central stage engine or upper stage engine. So it's very clear. But don't forget there are actually also another type which is unpopular. Uh, so if you can remember this, uh, the liquid engine model and the solid engine model is uh, more than enough for you. Go on. So now, let's see uh, engine pipes, uh, if you look at uh, as I've mentioned here, you have a liquid engine, you have a solid engine, and then you have a uh, solid liquid engine. You have a ga gas fuel engine. Gas fuel engine is basically a very small engine uh, embarked in satellite sometimes, uh, in fact most of the time, uh, and also basically in doctors basically to do that at fit control. But it is not for thrusting, it's not to do translation motion, it is more into rotational motion. So you will learn this. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, gas fuel engines in uh, satellite technology, I think you've been exposed to. Uh, so I think please uh, do refer back to that uh, chapters. Uh, again, it is uh, gas fuel engine is quite uh, popular uh, because it can actually help you to. It's very compact. It can help you to do a rotational motion. So that is the difference. But in rocket business, we are not talking about rotational business. Uh, we are talking about basically translation motion. So from one point to another point. But yet, uh, in rocket, uh, you will see in chapter uh, rocket control, you do have this uh, this small rocket engines to help the rocket also to do some active control. That is done. Uh, so there are the fuels that actually you have. You have uh, uh, you can see monoregol, diregol, and then regol. Is these are basically components. Basically, you will have monos. It says that there is only one component of fuel which will be used to uh, as a as a fuel, in fact. But if you have a diagonal, basically you have two components, and of course, try says that you have three components. So the one that not very popular is basically the trial. That is the reason it's only like experiment stage. I've actually put here. You see, most of if you look at di and uh, trigol, basically if you look at a coal gas, it is still under experiment stage. Now, why this is under experiment stage? Because, uh, for example, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. It's a super critical uh, state. Then if you want to put it in a satellite, then it's not very easy. So therefore, it is still an experiment. 
Uh, therefore, for smaller engines, uh, well, Geigos are not very popular. Uh, bigger liquid engines, yes, uh, sometimes yes, but more typical ones as you can see here, basically Monogold and Geigos, four liquid engines is there. Now, uh, if, you, if you look at actually uh, Geigos, basically you have two components of the uh, fuel and oxidator. This is a supercritical uh, state, which we have also treated in Ariane 5. If you can remember, you have done the exercise. So this is this example. But there are also actually uh, uh, only using hydrazine, for example, also for attitude control, etc. So you can remember that uh, technically Monogol and uh, Nigol is uh, popular for our business, or rather for rocket. Alright, go on. So this is a combination. Now if you look at uh, this table, it's a very interesting table. Uh, the specific impulse is important for us because that is going to actually help us to find the delta V for the rocket. Now, in order before we start using that, uh, we must know what kind of fuel that we are going to use, what kind of oxidator we can use, so that both combinations should, should be able to give you a good specific impulse. But if you look at the table, uh, like uh, the other time, I've also tell you the amount of force actually you can have uh, with respect to the pressure ratio, with respect to the surface ratio, and with uh, respect to the element temperature. Uh, more or less they are in the same category it's just because of the, the fuel that we put in also are more or less they are they are quite similar in terms of the output uh, of specific impulse now as you can see uh, oxidators is here and the fuse list of fuels actually I've given here all these abbreviation important ones actually we have list up here we'll give one example for you hydrogen basically hydrogen fuel then you can combine with that oxidator oxygen Technically, you can have a 391 uh, specific impulse. The one that I have uh, under underlined here, you can actually take note of it. Okay, I have underlined here. These are popular ones. If you look at this, this is a uh, hydrazine, hydrazine with the nitrogen tetroxide. It's quite common. It's available, and uh, this is actually MMH. Okay, with uh, oxygen, basically MMH with actually nitrogen tetroxide. So this is refined fuel also sometimes you have and uh, and also another type of fuel but as you can see the best combination that we have here is always hydrogen and oxygen that is the reason in your exercise that you have seen that we have used the supercritical uh, uh, conditions where hydrogen liquid and oxygen liquid because that's the best actually you can have uh, as a, a specific impulse you can say and uh, so please take note of that, and you can you can this is quite common uh, to to use. Now uh, don't forget, uh, this is basically a condition that all these uh, fuels and oxidators been uh, calibrated. Again, two components, two components. Okay, that means the uh, two entities. You have the fuel, you have the oxidator. There go. Uh. Now uh, this is actually at the equivalent state, basically stable state. Now. This ratio is POPE ratio. That means your PO chamber pressure with respect to PE. Okay? So POPE ratio, which is calibrated at 68. So therefore, at a particular what exactly it means that they have used a particular engine, one type of engine, they have changed the fuel and calculated the specific impulse. If you start changing the engine, then it will not actually give you a uh, indicator. So you maintain the engine, you change the fuel, then you know what is how much uh, impulse actually it can provide you uh, based on the fuel combinations that you have. All right, go on. All right, if you look at a specific impulse, obviously, uh, as you can see here, now you you tend to understand why is it again standard that you have used basically on this calibrated standard, huh? Now, uh, this is just for calibration purposes, just to tell you the fuel efficiency, in fact. Okay, it is nothing to do with the engine efficiency, it is just telling you the fuel efficiency, which are the fuel that actually you want to use so that the specific impulse is going to actually go higher. That's all it is. Now, more importantly, if you have a POPE higher, then this actually it doesn't, uh, doesn't apply. You understand? So, you, a different engine will have a different POPE. Now this is just put a remark there, this is just for a convenient for us to define the actual impact of the fuel that you use and oxidator you use 
with respect to the ISP. More importantly, what I want to show here, very, very popular is lipid food. That is the reason up to today, we are very, very comfortable with lipid fuel in use. You may ask, why not we go for triangles? Remember, space in space, everything is money. If you have a diagonal, you must have actually two tanks. If you have to have diagonal, basically you have to have three tanks. So, in terms of, yes, technically, it is better compared to liquid fuel. But unfortunately, the cost that actually you are going to have and the volume which is going to cost you. Now, if you go and put a tank to store the fuel, imagine the satellite might be actually having a lesser space. So might as well just use the space for satellite. So that is the reason this trade-off can be made. So we are sticking up to today to the liquid fuel. But we are using, as I mentioned just now, we are using two components, liquid fuel fully and solid fuel fully, but simultaneously we are using both. Okay? Again, if you can get about 500 seconds of impulse for liquid fuel engines is already very, very good. Very, very good. Uh, for example, SSNE, we have done in our exercise, uh, I think chapter 2, uh, Space Shuttle Main Engine is about 455 seconds. It's already on a very, very good uh, our specific impulse. Now, uh, please do understand that the thermal engine that we talk about, this is all thermal engine, remember? I told you about thermal engine, I told you about electrical engines. These are all thermal engine types. So it looks like thermal engine types, that's all. Specific, you can't push the specific impulse higher. So the technology, there is a plateau to it. That means there's a maximum to it and this is it. In coming chapters, we will also learn electrical engine. Then you will see how this is going to actually change. So what we can conclude in this uh, uh, slide, we have tried our level best in chapter 3. We have tried our level best to do a fantastic uh, ratios, let's say, to come up with a fantastic ratios of temperature, uh, pressure, and of course surface ratio. We have optimized that. Even after optimizing, we still can't actually push the specific impulse. That's the max actually we have. Then in this particular chapter, chapter 4, what we have done, okay, let's see now. Let's let's try to optimize the fuel that, and the oxidators that we have used. But if you look at the table just now, most of the fuels and oxidators combination are giving us more uh, same region of uh, specific impulse. So which means that uh, all these are already an optimum or uh, at the maximum they could. Uh, that's all actually you can have for chemical or other thermal engines. No? Uh, solid fuel, again, specific impulse is even worse than worse than uh, liquid. Yeah. So uh, this is okay. See the composite double basis. This is a composite modified double basis. Eh? CMDB eh? composite modified double basis. You will see afterwards. If you, so, that means the boosters that you are using, it is not greater compared to. The liquid engines that you use. Okay, all this I think is very, very you are very familiar with all this. TO is basically the actual temperature inside this booster. You have a specific impulse again calibrated because I want to compare one to one. So I must actually also calibrate in terms of the actual pressure ratio. Same. So POPE is the same like what we have used for the uh, liquid engine just now. So based on that, the specific impulse you can actually compare compared to the liquid engine. Now, attention need to be given here. This is basically a, a radial rate. What it means by radial rate, centimeter per second, is the amount of solid fuel being used to produce the actual thrust that you have. Exhaust gas, that you can see. So, the burning rate, if you can see, so the faster that actually you burn, for example, the faster that you burn, the higher specific impulse you should have. That's true. The slower that you burn, 
The slower specific impulse that actually you will have. That's clear. So this is the burning rate. Now, uh, I will treat this separately. Uh, this is a very straightforward, uh, that's, well, it is not as complex as liquid engine. It is a very, very straightforward uh, calculation. We will treat this uh, a bit on uh, calculation, especially on the theory that we use, Robert Wheel equations, uh, on an exercise, so that you will understand how to actually uh, calculate or estimate uh, the solid uh, boosters or solid fuel. All right? Go on. Okay, solid fuel types you have, as I've mentioned just now, we have said that, that there are three compo uh, types that you have, composite double base and then composite modified double base. As you can see, uh, this is basically ammonium, okay, this is ammonium, you can have oxidator, it's aluminium. So that is the reason I told you just now, uh, in fact the other day also I told you, the popular mixture of fuel and oxidators, for example here, if you use ammonium, you will actually pair with a bit of uh, polybutylene, polybutylene, and then there is a mixture of aluminium for sure. So traces of aluminium and magnesium will be always there and a bit of beryllium depending on the manufacturer. Uh, if you go to all the test sites in the world, uh, if you go to maybe their plants, maybe harvest them, send them to lab, you will have the traces of aluminium or magnesium for sure because of the outgas. So this is very, very toxic. So if you go to any launch sites, uh, try not to actually plant any uh, fruits, any vegetables or whatsoever to eat because it's highly, highly toxic. It will be uh, not supposed to actually do that. It's very, very toxic. Okay? So uh, take note of that. So as oxidator and you have the fuel. So you have the additives, basically. Uh, uh, SRP is a shuttle rocket booster. It is just a booster. It's just like for Ariane. Okay, you have a, so you have a three basic types. Although, now what I want to actually explain here, or you must take note of this. We know that from specific impulse, composite maybe has the less specific impulse compared to composite modified okay, type. Or even the double base type. We know that. But yet, we are still using for our application. Now, reason being because it is very, very is efficient in terms of cost okay that's first thing second thing if you if you remember the actual job of the booster is basically to complement the main engine so you don't you already have a very efficient main engine let's say you're flying about maybe 400 or 500 uh, seconds impulse the main engine you don't need that much of actually uh, specific impulse on the booster's side Boosters is just going to help you to propel the rocket out of the gravitational field fast. That's all the idea. So you don't need a very high-end and expensive boosters. This is good enough to do the job. So most of the boosters that you see, very, very typical ones, you will have basically the ammonium and uh, polybutylene. This is quite very, very typical. Okay? But yet, I just want to actually explain to all of you saying that there are these types available but it doesn't mean we have to take the most uh, expensive one or the most uh, efficient one in terms of a specific impulse this is good enough okay no? all right now let's see that uh, chemical engine applications now uh, your subject is this rocket so for rocket the chemical engine that we talked about for example, you have diagol, that means you have the fuel, you have the oxidator, you mix them together, you get the rocket thrust. Start Earth to orbit. Yes, this is what you're doing. This is this is specifically this subject. Okay? Now, because you are in a space field, you must know uh, the whole mechanism because the same technology is being applied for different applications. Your, all your exercises that we are doing for chemical rocket is this. Earth to orbit. Now, there is also flying body engines, which is Earth to Earth. Technically, you are basically going around Earth. Okay? The thrust that you need basically is not too big. Compared to if you want to get out of planet Earth, it's big. Transfer engines. Transfer engines, you will have it in satellites. Orbit to orbit, 
For example, you have learned Homan transfer. This is done. Landing engines, orbit to surface. This we will uh, learn at the end of this subject, where we do a bit of re-entry. Okay? Mostly is for braking. When you want to re-enter to maybe a mass, you want to do braking. When you want to re-enter to planet Earth, you want to do braking, then yes, you need an engine to brake. That means thrust vector the other side. But don't forget, we are going to leverage more on that aero braking also. Aero braking. That we will learn in the last chapter. Auxiliary engines, attitude control. You see how small is this? Remember just now, I have told you that uh, altitude control, not only for satellite, but, but also for rockets, it's a very small type of engine. Okay, very, very small type. Therefore, it produces a very, very small amount of thrust. It's good enough, basically, to produce the rotational motion, not translation motion. You want trans looks like if you want to go from Earth to orbit, you need a very, very high amount of thrust. And that is the reason we always, always say that the delta V maximum is what we want to achieve. Delta V max is what you want to achieve. Okay? Now, this also ap be applicable for, this orbit can be Earth orbit. It can be also Moon orbit. It can be also Mars orbit or interplanetary mission orbits. Okay? Right. So, but we are, uh, give me the other one, please. Remember, we are here. We are here. This whole subject is here. But don't forget, space mechanics were here. Your satellite technology is here. This is, next semester, you will have spacecraft dynamics and control, one subject. That will be here. And this one, landing engines, will be in this chap I mean, in this uh, subject, the last chapter, seventh chapter, chapter seven. So the whole overview of space systems is here. We are only focusing on here, all right? Okay. But once you you learn these engines, I think uh, it's all the equations are all similar. Same in fact. Go on. Let's let's look at one example. This is a very typical example uh, that you have. Now, system, you will have an uh, orbiter, uh, orbit maneuvering system, you can write, orbit maneuvering system, then you have a reaction control system. Orbit maneuvering system is basically to do orbit maneuvers, that means translation motion. This is actually rotational motion. Okay? So for that, you look at structure and engine, huge. Okay, fuel, very typical as I've mentioned to you, MMH, hydrogen, and nitrogen tetracycline, standard. Okay, engine thrust, as you can see, this is quite standard. This varies, huh? this varies from the rocket engine type. You have an external tank, very beautiful tanks you have. If you can see the brown tank, that is going to actually give us basically a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. That's a lot. Look at actual the 35 ton. Eh? That means the, the 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 fuel to store store the fuel. It is insufficient to store inside. You have to have an external tank. Just imagine, let's say you're driving a car. It's not enough basically a tank. So you have to actually maybe have a caravan at the back to put your fuel. To so much of fuel you need. Eh? Then uh, this is actually booster. Yeah, shuttle. Uh, uh, rocket booster. This is booster. This is solid, huh? Solid fuel. You have two of that. Once you go up, once uh, you reach about 100 seconds, then also this will total. So if you look at total, and look at the total fuel that you need, almost two million kilogram unit fuel. That's a lot, huh? It's about, huh? It's a lot. It's a lot. A lot of fuel. So that, that's, that's how uh, well it's com complex this whole system is. Uh, well, in any case, uh, your shuttle is as good as, or rather, the system is similar to your Ariane 5 or uh, other heavy lifters. Go on. 
Okay, tank design. Now, uh, material is important. Storage fuel, for example, hydrazine. These are typical materials that you use. Uh, aluminium, stainless steel is quite typical. Uh, attention to be given here uh, for cryogenic uh, states, basically stainless steel use. But sometimes titanium also is been applied. Okay? Uh, because it's a super critical, means very, very cold. Huh? Cold kind of uh, And pressure tanks, stainless steel will be used. This is quite typical. There are lots of actually designs that you have how to actually do the tank. But at the end of the day, it depending on the actual manufacturer, how you want to uh, position the tank. Huh? That's the thing. Alright, go on. Alright, this is a bit on the combustion chamber volume. Combustion chamber volume is uh, important. Uh, combustion chamber volume is given uh, by this. You can calculate. This is a, uh, I use a specific uh, gas uh, equation. Uh, chapter 3, I think page 20. If you go back to page 20, chapter 3, uh, you can invoke all, all this relevant equation. Gamma is nothing but is proportional to CPCV and you have the actual equation can be written here. This is quite clear. The mass, the mass actually is needed is basically the time of combustion and the fuel injected into the chamber. So that gives you the mass. Then you use that same equation. Practically, you can look at the volume. Once the volume is actually is calculated, so you know the actual how much of chamber that actually you need to design. So that's how actually it's been calculated. Uh, it's quite simple. Then uh, that once you have the volume, so technically another important thing is that characteristic length. This is always with respect to the throat that you have. So what, this is a very, very interesting thing later I will give you. You can design whatever actually tanks, you can, uh, shape that you have. This is quite typical, which has already been investigated for space. These are the types of uh, uh, systems that you have. More often than not, you have uh, cylinder type is quite common. Okay, uh, Sphere type is also common. Uh, these are the main ones I, I put you uh, put uh, on top here is basically so the main ones. These are actually quite uh, rare, I would say. Yeah, quite tight and stuff, stuff like that. Go on. Okay, this is a very very interesting thing. For the bigger, uh, this is you can see this is a, a typical type huh, of uh, of a design. For ten thousand kilos, thousand kilos, hundred kilos, and ten kilos. Now, what exactly it means that? Now, for 1,000 kilos, let's say the throat length is 10 meters, okay? So, what you do is that you can reduce it. Let's say for 1,000 kilos, this will be about a centimeter. Very, very small. Yeah? So, this, so you can reduce it. So, you can imagine uh, when it gets very, very small, the throat is very, very thin. Very thin, very slight. Yeah? So, for a 10,000 kilogram, for example, you have only the throat is about <coughs> 10 centimeters. Actually, it's quite huge, you know. <laughs> uh, it's quite huge. Yeah? 10 centimeters. Alright? Uh, these are the typical dimensions that actually you have. Alright, go on. So, uh, hypergol property oxidators, basically oxidators, uh, if you have an hypergols, for example, uh, basically uh, uh, liquid oxygen you have. This is oxidator. This is oxidator. Uh, well, you, you don't have any any fuel. It's a hyper hypergol fuel. Okay. Now, uh, if you have oxidator of uh, hydrogen tetroxide, then you have uh, with most of the fuel it can combine. Uh, again, oxidator basically you can uh, you can combine with the uh, UDMH, uh, MMH, etc. Okay. Mm. Right, and please do refer to all those uh, uh, fuels and uh, oxidators that I gave you. Yeah, hydrogen peroxide you have hydrogen peroxide. This is liquid. This is acid. All right. Uh, then uh, the length. The length we have calculated the length. So if you can see that the actual length is is given here, seventy to ninety uh, centimeters. So it's it's quite almost about maybe 100 centimeters huh? so it's quite uh, long and we have calculated using the L formula that actually I have given you with respect to all those actually fuels that you have alright so it's quite standard anyway. alright go on 
Well, these are some examples how uh, unconventional nozzles have been uh, sort of researched upon, uh, but this has not been flown. Uh, people are trying, instead of having one big nozzle, why not we actually have a small nozzles? So is this better? Yes, it gives you better performance, but unfortunately, uh, the cost is quite high, to control the flow is quite high and quite uh, challenging, but obviously if it's in a, in a terrestrial uh, mode in the lab, it seems to be quite positive compared to you have only one. Because remember, it's very, very focused and intense. So you end up slightly on it, but don't forget, you also have a higher losses, higher losses with respect to that one single nozzle. So unconventional nozzles here, one, it's quite typical. This is actually dual type. This is a belt type. Okay. Now we haven't spoke much about this design, whether it is going to be basically symmetric like that, or it is going to be a uh, dual type, you know, we haven't talked about it, because I think that is uh, not very critical, what is more important is that nozzle need to have a good ratio of surface ratio, nozzle should provide that, period, okay, and this we can actually go on investigating, huh? there's so many actually versions of this, okay, go on, and uh, cooling type, I think uh, in uh, chapter 3, I've also explained to you Basically, uh, we can we can do uh, cooling. Basically, how to actually cool? We can use practically the the fuels to cool, and then we reuse basically the uh, the fuel to burn. So that is been quite uh, what is explained here in the in the uh, liquid fuel pipe. In the solid fuel, is basically uh, as you know, if this is your fuel, and actually it burns from inwards. Sorry, outwards, in fact. Yeah, outwards. It depends how you see it. Yeah. So this is how it is being cooled down, in that sense. All right? Gone. Uh, this is another ablation type. Now, uh, just note this. Uh, this has not been flown in that sense, okay? Because ablation type, there is a metal burning. So, metal, material burning here, material can be burning here or here or here basically let's say this is your system you will have the material which has to be burned on top covered covered with that let's say the nozzle is covered with that material the whole system is covered with the material so what you can see if you see outside you're using this kind of system the whole system will be burning that means there is a there's a fire outside it doesn't work that way if you, it doesn't work in our rocket. You haven't seen actually, I've shown you in a video, you don't see something burning outside. You only see the burning comes out of divergence or nozzle. Now this system, they have some experiments on it. Assume that we want to launch a rocket. What if the burning is actually is outside? Okay, that means the burning means like the cooling is outside. That means you have the heat. Heat has been actually dissipated by burning material. Yes, of course. If you have heat inside, let's say you want to dissipate that, you can let it just like that now, and then uh, uh, radiation cooling will happen, or you can actually put a material on top of it, which with, with certain temperature you reach, let's say 1000 degrees, then you start burning. Now that is not very typical in our rocket, but it is very typical in capsule. So you will see in the last chapter, this method will be used in our capsule, yeah, to cool the capsule. Now, remember, uh, for example, capsule, temperatures will be 1,200, 1,400 degrees or Celsius. Human is sitting inside. So, you, anything, any any leakage, you are gone. Yeah? So, ablation cooling is, uh, you can write here, maybe it's for, not for our rockets, so to say, it's for our uh, re-entry with capsule, not with shuttle, but capsule. Okay, go on. And you have uh, examples of uh, dump cool uh, systems, which is a uh, uh, regenerative cooling. Then you want to run the pipe. How you want to run the internal pipe? You can run it this way, you can run it this way, you can run it. 
upwards it depends on so many design actually they have okay but the prin principle is that the hot gas is going to uh, heat up the, the actual fuel in this case it's going to be fueled and then the fuel will be actually reused to to burn so you you are going to actually uh, have a bit more energy not wasted but in fact it's been used all right okay uh, so that's I think uh, that's about it in chapter 3 chapter in fact chapter 4 uh, if you look at it most of the equations uh, which uh, we dwell in chapter 4 are based on actually chapter 3 so chapter 4 is an extension of the actual type of engines that you use how the tanks would be and uh, what kind of actually combinations that we can have in order for us to actually optimize the delta V that we, we always talk about so the conclusion of chapter 4 that we have seen looks like chemical engines or rather thermal engines is not actually giving us any other options or giving us more delta V that we want we have tried with all those ratios we have optimized our WE in lab okay that means we have optimized our surface ratio we have optimized our pressure ratio we have optimized our temperature ratios with all that we, we can't actually have a higher uh, delta V so what we have tried now maybe in chapter 4 what, what we did is that now let's see let's start actually combining uh, different kind of oxidators different kind of fuels in order for us to achieve a higher impulse remember delta V is proportional to the actual impulse so if we can have a higher impulse I think we should have a higher delta V but the table have also explained to us that look it is remember what kind of com available combination I tried to use we still end up in the same sort of a region so technically speaking uh, we need to maybe migrate to some other technology in order for us to have a higher delta V or in order specifically to have a higher specific impulse specific impulse need to be pushed up and let's see how we can do it in chapter 5 uh, we may want to actually look at different kind of engine not any more the thermal engines but always remember for earth orientation oriented mission means you are flying a uh, satellites earth oriented satellites you want to put the satellite into its orbit you always will talk about the thermal engines specifically liquid engine liquid engine plus with a solid engine that is a typical rocket that you have all those uh, current uh, providers are flying with this technology uh, period so now let's see in order for us to have more uh, delta v we need to actually look into some other options now why is that we need to have more delta v why is that is we need to okay as far as we are concerned we are flying so many uh, uh, satellites been uh, launched in fact we have sent human to space station and then they have written everything seems to be working but there is always a need for us to go further that means to go into some other planets to do interplanetary missions with the interplanetary missions requirement it seems that our thermal engines it is insufficient that is the reason that we need to now look into some of the options specifically looking into the electrical proportion because there is uh, some good advantages that we can leverage on to fly further to have a bigger delta V to go even further than mass even so that is that uh, so we know that constraint and that is the reason that we I think we need to look into some of the options that we will do in chapter 5 so now uh, probably uh, next week I think next week we can still treat uh, uh, equations uh, sorry uh, assignments because this week I think you have already one and next week we need to actually finish up there is a lot of uh, I think uh, another three more exercises that we need to do for chapter 3 inclusive of chapter 4 thereafter we will actually migrate to uh, we will actually uh, start uh, chapter 5 so I have another three more chapters hope uh, I think the situation will become better so that we can do a face to face otherwise uh, we are in chapter 5 I think we need to we need to do uh, well I would say online uh, but nevertheless uh, don't worry about the assignments uh, try to do your assignments yourselves first then you, you compare it with the group alright and let's see uh, let me uh, maybe next week I will try to actually give you a bit more information 
uh, how to submit those uh, assignments uh, or you keep it when we actually meet uh, face to face then we can actually collect that but more importantly you must try that alone uh, I was also made to understand that the test that we have done test one a lot of people were, were confused you know so that is uh, the root cause of all this confusion is basically never do assignment yourself that means you need to actually write you need to actually do yourself so that when exam comes or test comes then you should be able to actually remember and start actually doing it yourself if you see it doesn't work if you just see and memorize it doesn't work you have to do it you just have to do it and uh, again uh, test one I've uh, practically given a carbon copy of your exercise almost so test two please do expect a bit more uh, challenges in terms of question uh, because it's 25 marks uh, with that, I see you maybe uh, next week, uh, hopefully, uh, in assignments. Alright, thank you so much.